Hey, my head's my range range, and I'm at a graveyard today. Gotta get my heebie and jeebie levels off the charts this Christmas, so I went to a hot tourist location. It's definitely not just bad be green screened. <laughs> I've covered a lot of scary topics on this channel, like plants, Spelunky 2, letters, and especially Crazy Bus, but today is no joke the scariest of them all. Reddit posts! I need a spooky topic to talk about this Halloween, so. Let's talk about gaming creep and fun. Oh my god, have I sunk this low already? But I can't talk about this here. Statistically, the biggest cause of death is death. And the death deaths will get mad at me if I talk about death and the location of death. So, I gotta get back to my room. See? Like that. That was one of the death deaths. He's angry at me for talking about death and the location of death. Oh, fuck! So, let's get back to my room, shall we? How did I get here again? When did my clothes change? When did these lights turn on? Gaming creepypastas and urban legends. They are in fact something. What the hell? I've seen quite a few creepypastas and urban legends in the gaming world, so I decided to do some research on some of the most iconic legends and some lesser known ones too. The history of these legends, once again, starts back at the dawn of time. The 1980s. Polybius is a pretty infamous urban legend in the gaming space. It revolves around an arcade machine in the government of fucking Oregon. Now, now. I hate getting political, but I have to issue my grievances. Everybody needs a copy of Pikmin 4! I'm sorry, it's the law! It's sickening people to follow this! The Legend of Polybius basically goes like this. Random new arcade game appears in fucking Portland in 1981, and it basically drove people insane. People couldn't get enough of this historian for some reason! The game would supposedly flash subliminal messages at the player, tormenting the players, making them suffer from nightmares, seizures, suicidal thoughts, and even death. The government decided, oh, whoa, shit, whoops, uh, we killed a bunch of people with the game, alright, fuck you, uh, Oregon, let's remove this dumbass game. The legend appeared for the first time online back in 1998 on CoinOp, when someone said, Whoa, guys, I've totally got that wrong for Bolivias. Trust me, we went back to ancient Greece to talk to a guy. <laughs> so basically, Polybius was a government brainwashing device. Well, not really, because it didn't exist. Obviously, Polybius was fake. C come on, why would its first known mention be in 1998 if it's from around the 80s? Also, how would news sources not get all over this? I guess the government maybe stopped them, but whatever. It made sense that it went around because people were worried about the effects that games could have on players. But this was pretty fake. Urban legends weren't really new by this point, but gaming urban legends were a little bit newer. I'd say that Polybius is probably where gaming creepypastas got their form, so I think it's worth a mention here. But creepypastas wouldn't start to pop up until a few years later, with stuff like Ted the Caver. Here's where I think I should preface that I must be specifically talking about GAMING creepypastas. Not stuff like Slender or Jeff the Killer, which are creepypastas that got spun in the games but creepypastas based off of games, or creepypastas on fictional games. So let's talk about those creepypastas, because that's the point of this goddamn video. After some research, aka reading and googling for like 30 minutes, I can't find anything that outright tells me the first gaming creepypasta to surf the internet other than Polybius. So I'll start with a pretty safe bet, Ben Drowned. Ben Drowned is a very popular creepypasta that appeared back in 2010 created by Alex Hall, or Jaduzable. The story follows Jaduzable as he buys a copy of Majora's Mask from an old guy at a yard sale, and then he plays it and finds out that the game is haunted by the spirit of a boy named Ben. Guess what Ben did? He burned alive in a house fire on October 26, 2005. I, I kid, of course. What do you think? He fucking drowned. The game is also haunted by some weird-ass entity that is known as Ben. I wonder who that guy is. And also the father. Holy shit, Jesus is in this game? Deducible. The fuck that I'm calling him Jad for the rest of this. Does so the fourth day glitch, and then the game does some spooky shit and tells him cryptic messages like, You've met a terrible fate, haven't you? Jad starts encountering Ben. And then it became an ARG, and then it disappeared for about 8 years until it came back in the form of an ARG again in 2020. Looking back on Ben Drowned, it weirdly made some sense. Majora's Mask is a much darker game than a lot of Nintendo games. It has a much gloomier and doomier tone, especially with the whole Hey, the world is about to fucking explode when the moon crashes into it kind of thing. And also a lot of theories and mysteries surround this game. Specifically theories about Link and if he's even alive in the game at all. So I think a creepypasta for this game made sense. But it's a creepypasta so obviously it was fake. But Ben Drowned set the scene for what was soon to come in the gaming creepypasta landscape. Another important gaming creepypasta from 2010 was the Lavender Town Syndrome creepypasta. The legend follows that after the releases of Pokemon Red and Green in 1996, children from ages 10 to 15 had a spike in death rates. 
and supposedly this was connected to the background music of Lavender Town, which is a place in the games where the graves of Pokemon can be found. The legend says that children are more susceptible to the effects of the music because the supposed binaural beats and high-pitched tone that it includes that only children could hear. Now, this was a creepypasta, an urban legend to scare the kids. But there is a very tiny ounce of truth connected to a real event that occurred in 1997. Back in 1997 in Japan, an episode of the Pokemon anime was released titled Deno Senji Porygon. I said that wrong, didn't I? There's a scene in this episode that includes flashing lights and flickering images that cause seizures in hundreds of viewers. While this isn't really related to the games that the Lavender Town Syndrome was about, there is a chance that it was inspired by this real life event. Now there's a lot of creepy bosses out there. I won't be able to cover all of them. Oh my god, I do not have a death wish. But I'll talk about the big one. God, fucking damn it, do I really have to talk about Sonic.exe? Sonic.exe first appeared in 2011, created by JC the Hyena. The story follows Tom, who gets a CD from some guy named Kyle, and not saying destroy it. I don't know why I'm giving it to you and why I didn't just destroy the game, but whatever. Tom plays the game, and whoa, it's a haunted version of Sonic. I Fucking hate this creepy pasta. Sonic takes on the form of Twitter in this haunted version of the game and he's got blood and eyes. Tom plays as Miles, Fist, and Theodore Roosevelt, who all get fucking murdered by Elon Musk. After everyone dies to Twitter, a hyper-realistic version of Twitter appears, stating that he's Jesus, and then Sonic the Platypus appears on Tom's bed. I never liked this creepy pasta. Sure, it was influential, but it never seemed well written to me. Why would Kyle make someone else destroy the CD? Why would he not just do it himself? Why the fuck does a random Sonic plushie appear on Tom's bed? What the hell is the point of that? Sonic.exe did kind of have a resurgence recently though, with new fan games appearing like Sonic.eoix and a lot of YouTubers playing them. I still don't like it. But even though I don't like Sonic.exe, NES Godzilla! This one is actually kind of cool with the amount of work the author put into it. The author made thousands of custom sprites just for this creepypasta. The story follows a character named Zack who plays an unusual copy of Godzilla Monster of Monsters for the NES. Zack plays through the game and what used to be simple glitches he'd encounter turn into entirely new content. Holy shit, it's a Bethesda game. These new features include entirely new monsters that never appeared in the original game. One of these new monsters is the supernatural being named Red. Zack begins to unravel the mystery behind Behind this being and finds out that it has much closer ties to Zack than he expected. Eventually, Zack beats the shit out of the color red and the story concludes. I find that creepypasta kind of interesting, and I don't say that about creepypastas, like ever, but this one actually intrigues me. It feels less like your typical creepypasta, more like an actual story. It's not just faceless Mario, what the fuck, one, 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 one. And the effort put into this one is pretty massive with the insane sprite work. You know what I don't like? This stupid fucking Cuphead creepypasta. If you pirate Cuphead, King Dice will fucking kill you. Yeah, that makes sense. The story follows some guy who trips over a Cuphead box. What the fuck is this shit? He plays it, and lo and behold, it's Cuphead, but the intro song was reversed, pitched down, and it had reverb. He keeps playing, and then he gets to the die house, where the walls turn fucking red for some reason, and then it cuts to black, and then... Whoa! King Dice jump scare. Whoa! There was laughing and screaming and fucking stabbing, and then it cuts to the logo, but... Whoa! Cuphead and Mugman are gone because King Dice fucking killed them. Uh, Microsoft Sam said, you're playing, or sorry, you playing a pirated version of Cuphead. Destroy the game now. Do I need to explain why I hate this one? Tell me, how many times has this happened to you? Ah, uh, what a lovely day. <laughs> The Callisto Protocol, why do people keep leaving this on the sidewalk? There's also the Reddit version. <laughs> this one also follows someone who pirates the game. God damn it, why did everybody pirate the game? Buy the fucking game, it's like the seventh best game of all time. The narrator opens the pirated version and is greeted with the normal title screen, but with no prompt to actually play the game. And then a few minutes later, Cuphead stops his animations and just stares at the screen. And then Mugman disappears. And that becomes an EXE gore fest. Horror. Perhaps the best creepypasta of them all. The most in-depth one, calling it a creepypasta almost feels like a disservice to it, is Petscop. I like Petscop. You can probably get that from the fact that I've made songs about it. Petscop is a series of videos released on YouTube as a let's play of an unfinished PS1 game from 1997 called Petscop. The game follows your character who goes around collecting pets to progress the game. Now the game is fairly clearly unfinished. Our main character of the series, Paul, just walks out of boundaries and everything seems very empty. But there's more to it. This isn't just an unfinished game. There's something much more sinister at play here. Paul enters a code he found on a note that came with the game and he gets taken to a dark and empty world. 
and things only get more and more disturbing. Now, I haven't been exactly truthful about this game. Petscop is not real. The only confirmation and proof of its existence is the Let's Play series. The game doesn't exist, the company behind it doesn't exist, and the game never existed. It was made for this fake Let's Play series, which is an insane amount of dedication. So this creepy pasta isn't like the others in numerous ways. One, it's not based on a real game, and two, it's not really a creepy pasta. You see, creepy pastas derive from copy pastas, which are texts or photos or videos or whatever that get copy pasted and sent all around the internet. Creepy pastas are that, but horror or faces Mario dead Sonic with blood and guts and tests and scary text fucking Dean Ozzy, what the fuck? Petscop isn't really that though. Petscop is more of an actual story. The story of a game that never saw the light of day, but tells a disturbing story, hidden by the facade of a family friendly game for kids. It's not something that gets copy pasted around the internet, sure, maybe it gets shared, but so does everything. And that right, I don't think it's fair to call Petscop a creepy pasta. It's not. It's not really an urban legend. It's more of a story in a world. And there's way more to Petscop than I'll ever be able to cover in this video, but I would eventually like to do a deep dive video on it. I'm actually already working on it, and I'm working on something similar for the Doom 2 mod myhouse.wad. But all of these creepypastas are either just haunted versions of games you can't play or games that just don't exist. So what if they did? That's where Catastrophe Crow or Crow 64 comes in. Crow 64 was an unfinished and unreleased Nintendo 64 game that was forgotten, buried until a man by the name of Adam Butcher brought it back in a video titled, What Happened to Crow 64? But what makes Crow 64 so unique in the sea of gaming creepypastas? Well, it actually exists. Now obviously Mario and Cuphead and Sonic and NES Godzilla and more exist, but the haunted versions in the creepypastas don't. The closest we have to the actual versions are the normal games and fan games. And the Pescop just doesn't have a game to play. Which is so fucking unfortunate, by the way, I really want to play it. But Crow 64 is the game to go along with it. The same version from the so-called Creepypasta, which is more of an ARG than anything. Crow 64 follows a forgotten N64 game that was never released, and its developer, Manfred Lawrence, supposedly went out to sea and disappeared. This is a guy to look up to. Make a Nintendo 64 game, don't release it, and then fucking die. Now the story of Crow 64 remains unsolved, even with a HUH! 72 page document? What the fuck? Fuck. But it may remain unsolved forever, as most activity around the ERG stopped less than a year after it started. Or did it? Within the past two months, activity on Adam Butcher's YouTube channel strangely increased. Adam only uploaded about two other videos after the Crow 64 video, until about two months ago where Adam got a letter from Opus, one of the companies tied into the ARG and also about a month ago where a video titled Get Ready was uploaded. This was leading to the release of a Catastrophe Crow plushie, which may sound uninteresting, just a cool little collectible, but it had been over three years since Crow 64 surfaced and about two years after activity around it slowed down. Why now of all times? Couple that with the fact that Opus apparently said a playable version of Crow 64 is coming soon. I think we're seeing a revival in the release of what Crow 64 could have been. Well, maybe Crow 64's ARG isn't exactly my thing, I'm interested to see where this story goes next. It seems that even if the ARG kinda died and ended a few years ago, it hasn't discouraged Adam from still working on it. Who knows what he has stored? But looking through these supposed creepypastas, I'm noticing a few things. Some of these are definitely creepypastas, but some of them are a little bit more debatable. Now a little bit earlier I said that creepypastas are more like copypastas, but horror. The things that get spread all around the internet, copied and pasted endlessly. Something like Sonic.exe or the weird cuphead pirating stories are creepypastas. But ones like Petscop and Crow64 are a little bit more debatable in my eyes. They have a lot of traits of creepypastas, but they're not really getting copy pasted all over Reddit to see every five seconds. They're their own self-contained stories, which is why I find it weird that they're lumped into the creepypasta category when I guess they're more of stories and ARGs. But I guess... Hold on, did you hear something? I swear to fucking God, if crazy bus is in my house again... Uh, what just happened? Did the power just come? What the fuck? What just happened? How did I get out here? Did I teleport again? Jeez, whatever. There was definitely something behind me. Guess I'll almost fit. Again? God, I...
I am a horror movie protagonist and I'm going to investigate the scary noises instead of just running away and hiding. What? I locked in? There's a note on the mirror. The here or Bryn E. Can you solve the Mazd? What? How, how do we get out of here? What the fuck? Jump scare. Oh, Jesus Christ! Oh my God, it's the most infamous creepy bust of them all. Damn, Ryan! Stop it! You better stop it, Hero Brian. I'm gonna call you short in ten different languages. You're short. Two at his bow. Two at petite. Tai Niski. Nihanai. Pandaka. Vishpentgort. Dubis Klein. Antakasira. Can you shut up? It didn't work. Calling you short in 10 different languages is supposed to kill you. I think. I don't know. What? I'll let you survive if you solve the maze. <laughs> Looks like it's time to heal right? Trademarked. You trademarked that? Yeah, I gotta have my catchphrase, dumbass. There. I'm going to brutally murder you now. You won't catch me. What? What just, what just happened to him? I am the holy sage, Nate, and I have saved you. What? I am the holy sage, Nate. Always remember. Good hygiene is important. Thanks. Goodbye. What? I mean, I guess I'll end this video that I was supposed to be the plan, but... Oh, it's back now. My god, what happened here? Did Herobrine do this? This is terrible. Oh, I wonder what's in that body bag. Mario Party Superstar! No, is he back? Yeah. Ah, uh, thanks for letting me know. No problem, I'm gonna dismember you now. No thanks. Sorry. Holy shit, Hero Brian! Hey. Ow, ow, ow. Stop, stop. Ow, fuck Mario Party! Ha! Get fucked by Mario Party, loser! Hey, not nice. Sorry. I'm gonna kill you. You know what? No. No, you won't. Your reign of horror ends here. I'm tired of you terrorizing everything. I just wanna talk about stupid creepy pastas. You are one, so I could talk about you, but whatever. Come and fight me! Okay. What? Huh? Say his name. No, come on, man. I was about to beat the shit out of him. <laughs>